Shall I start all over again? No. While every head is bowed. <laughs> Hello? Testing one, two. It's amazing how sometimes one finds oneself on the conveyor belt of time, you know, and moments that are anticipated, moments that are out there somewhere, suddenly become very tangible. I thank God that we can capture these moments on camera and on audio sound. But beyond all of that, you know, there's a greater capturing of the moment <coughs> when we realize that um, in the beginning was the Word. The word has a reference to it much larger than our best technology could ever wish to match. High definition cameras, megapixels could never quite capture what has already been captured for all eternity in image and likeness language. You see, God had nothing less in mind when he had you in mind to be the very bearer of his image and his likeness. You can afford to be embraced in his welcome. He's not embarrassed about you. He has always known you. He has written your DNA. And they say if you could count the individual characters in one single DNA strand, it amounts to three billion characters. Now, to help us appreciate and comprehend the volume of three billion individual characters in one single DNA strand in your 75 trillion cells that you have in your body, the difference between a million seconds and a billion seconds is a million seconds equals 12 days. A billion seconds, however, equals 32 years. So if you have three billion individual characters that God wrote in the script of your DNA, and it was your job on planet Earth to count, simply just count those characters at one character per second. Do you know how many? Three billion. How many seconds into one billion seconds? 32 years. Three times 32, that's 96 years. You're occupied. <laughs> And then we marvel at our technology. We marvel at our amazing, I thank God for technology, but there's something that beats technology. Sometimes, you know, one witnesses all these wonderful, greatest and greatest um, inventions, and one wonders why God did not perhaps delay the coming of Christ by 2,000 years. So at least we could have all that technology has to now capture every miracle, every moment of Jesus' life and ministry. M capture is zoom in on the miracles, you know, and, and, and capture the, 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 the mighty drama of the cross and the, and the resurrection and have it all on digital format. <laughs> you see, what you are in your very being could never be equaled, could never be matched by the furthest possible reference to technology out there in the future. Because he is not hiding in history or in outer space or in the far future. He is, I am, in you. Yeah. God has no greater reference of himself than what he has in you. When Paul writes in Colossians 1 and verse 15, he says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And that means God could never again go invisible. You see, our blunt instruments cannot measure Him. We can probe the skies with, with the latest Hubble telescope technology and expand our perceptions of space, but the heavens cannot measure him. You see, you cannot measure temperature with a ruler. But God has measured you. 
in a son. Sonship measures you. The word Messiah in the Hebrew and the Greek, Christos, in its root form, the word Meshach comes from the word to measure. It's a handbreadth. Geir from Christus, the hand. You still speak about today, we do of a 17 hand horse. It was the earliest measure. You see, there is a measure of you. That is unmatched in any other calculation but in the revelation of grace. Because in Ephesians 4 and verse 7, Paul says that grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Madame Curie was a Polish um, scientist, Marie Curie. A daughter wrote a book that Lydia and I once read, uh, Madame Curie won two Nobel Prizes for the discovery of radium. And uh, she was married to a professor in France, Pierre Curie, and him and his brother recently, at that time, which was in the late 1800s, um, discovered and developed an instrument, invented an instrument, whereby uh, science could now measure radioactive energy. And with the help of this instrument, Marie Curie did her doctorate. And she began to measure every known element. And in the process, she also began to test everything that she could possibly test related to recent discoveries. And at that time, recently, I think in the 1890s, science discovered uranium and thorium and extracted uranium and thorium for its value. But the discarded ore that was left out there on dumps, you know, because this, obviously now we've extracted its value. When Marie Curie tested the discarded ore with this new found instrument, guess what she read? She discovered the strongest reading of radioactive energy. It's been there all along. But science didn't have the correct instrument. And in the next 18 months, her and her husband labored in their back garden in a makeshift lab, laboratory. And when they finally extracted the first ounce of radium, it represented only one millionth of a percent of the ore that they had to work through in order to extract this precious element. You see, the moment the value is discovered, The ore takes on new meaning. And when Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now he says it in the context in 2 Corinthians 4 of a blindfold person in unbelief. You see the blindfold cannot steal the treasure. The treasure is still there. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, the God of this world, speaking about the religious system of this world, blindfolds the minds of the unbeliever. So who is the unbeliever? It is the one who believes a lie about themselves. Israel did not die in the desert because of a lack of provision, a lack of protection. I mean, they witnessed the supernatural 24-7 for 40 years. Hebrews chapter 4 says they died because of unbelief. So what defines unbelief? Certainly not the lack of the supernatural. I mean, the supernatural does not confirm faith. Because they died through unbelief. They thought, well, the more miracles, we, we, we're on course. <laughs> you can Google us. We're in the desert, but we're happy. <laughs> You're in unbelief. The most dangerous, more dangerous than being a slave of Pharaoh. Would you agree with me that the whole of Israel 
enjoyed exactly an equal reference to their deliverance from Pharaoh. Every single Israeli, all 12 tribes, enjoyed exactly the same reference to their freedom. And yet they died in the desert. The sad thing about their death was that they never possessed the promise, which was the nations. And so often we can get all, you know, cuddly in our us for and no more mentality. And we witness the miraculous because the mercy of God endures forever. We witness God's provision. We witness all kinds of wonderful evidence of the goodness of God. But that is not to confirm that you're in the right place. The God of this world blindfolds the minds of the who? The unbeliever. Who's the unbeliever then? Every single person, including the most sincere Christians on planet earth, who continues to believe a lie about their salvation. Who continues to believe a lie about themselves. Do you see, the whole of salvation, the whole of the book is about Jesus. But the whole of Jesus is about you. Jesus didn't have any problems with sin, with temptation, with the diabolos. He desires for us to to know even as we have always been known. So He stepped into our world to awaken our understanding. Where did Israel's unbelief come from? Remember when the twelve spies were sent out. Sometimes we think, well, those 12 spies were 12 brave volunteers. No, they were the 12 leaders of the 12 tribes. They represented their tribe. And they went out to spy out the promise. Problem is, you go with a question mark mentality. You come out back with a bigger question mark. You see, the Bible is a book full of promises. Bestseller, after all these years still. I believe they did a, a program on the History Channel recently, the Bible. They hit the top viewer rating ever. Millions of people witnessed that. But it remains the most dangerous book on planet Earth. Yes. It has caused more division, more confusion than any other book. And we can scrutinize the pages of this book. But unless you go with the code, you'll remain confused. You see, it's not a question mark. It's an exclamation mark that unlocks the message of this book. I'm so glad that when Paul was struck blind, he was led to the address and they gave him the road reading. You know, get this into your GPS. Go to the road called Straight. (laughs) hey there's a shortcut out of the wilderness (laughs) you don't have to die in the desert so when these 12 readers return we read in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 33 the majority vote said guys there are giants out there you know everything that you know the promise suggested was true we saw that we witnessed that but we have a problem We have giants. Two of them, Caleb and Joshua, saw exactly the same giants. But they went in with the exclamation mark and they returned with the same exclamation mark because they have a different spirit. They've just seen the the freshness of their salvation, the power of their salvation, was such a reality to them. They walked in in the conviction that we are slaves no more. I mean, when we were faced with that flooded river and we heard the noise of Pharaoh's chariots trying to gain in on us again, God said through Moses, these Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. So give me the giants. Oh, but the leaders warned, you know, we have seen giants out there and by comparison we are like grasshoppers. Do you know what a giant will do to a grasshopper? He'll just step on you. And you know what we've done? 
we've preached a defeated devil back into business. And the God of this world blindfolds the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. What is the light of the gospel all about? It is to exhibit the glory of God in your face. In the face of a man. So that we all with unveiled faces, says Paul in that same conversation a few verses earlier. Remember Paul didn't write in chapters and verses. We're talking 2 Corinthians chapter 4 now. This is verse 4 that we've just mentioned. But in verse uh, 18 of the previous chapter, I might as well read you one of my most favorite verses in the Bible. Um, So I'll just touch on that. Paul says we are... are, uh, the days of window shopping are over. In him every fa- no, no, I'm not going to read it from the mirror. Then we're going to start preaching a different message right now. I'm just going to carry on with this. <laughs> the, the more f- Lord, I thank you for a whole weekend. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 3.18 in a more familiar context. And now with unveiled faces, what? We all. You notice the all? I mean, I think Paul got it from his name. Paul all. Paul all. So, we all with unveiled faces. That means there is not one single person on planet earth that can claim ignorance. Because the invisible God was made visible in the incarnation. God's never ever in all eternity going to become more visible than what He already is. With unveiled faces we are beholding the what? The glory of the Lord. As in a mirror. And what happens in the beholding Him? I discover me. Because change happens. Metamorphosis, says Paul. There's a metamorphosis that takes place. And this metamorphosis is not going to take 40 years in the desert. This metamorphosis um, engages my mind with a new reference. From the glory that defined me before to a glory that was my original design. The blueprint, what God had in mind when He said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So the God of this world wants to blindfold the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, which is the glory of God in the face of a man. God's glory is on exhibit. And He says, all flesh shall see it together. He has measured us in Christ. When Paul now says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 16, From now on therefore, we no longer know anyone according to the flesh. He understands that our measure of ourselves our idea of ourselves, our definition of ourselves can never again be measured by the blunt instrument of the law. But we are measured in Christ. He has the blueprint of our design on record. God has you on record. And it doesn't matter how many years we have wasted in the wilderness. God rescued us in Christ. Do you see what kept Israel in the wilderness was a lie they believed about themselves. We are grasshoppers. Paul says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. In Joshua chapter 2 and verse 11, we can just fast forward the Israel story now by 40 years. It's always good to read the end of the story. Some stories seem to go never, never end. This one has a very happy ending. This time now Joshua, one of the two, who went in with an exclamation mark and returned with an exclamation mark. I'm so glad 40 years later even Caleb said, hey, I am as strong as I was 40 years ago. Paul didn't say, Abraham didn't say, well, you know, not Abraham, Paul, Caleb. (laughs) Caleb, sorry, (laughs) Caleb. Caleb's faith was not diminished by the unbelief of the majority. As strong as I was 40 years ago, given a high places. 
So this time Joshua and Caleb sent out two spies. They're not going to trust the other ten this time. So two guys went, and they met with this lady who lived in the wall of the city of Jericho. And when she heard that they were Israelis, she was totally overwhelmed. She says, hey, we heard about your God 40 years ago. And you know what? There was not a man in our midst who was not shaking with fear. Who was right? Who was right? The leaders or this girl? (laughs) We have preached a defeated devil back into business. It is a shame to go into Christian bookstores and see the volumes of books written about a defeated devil. Know your enemy. There's only one thing you need to know about your enemy and that is thoroughly defeated. But that diabolos, through the full mindset, that satanos, accusation mindset, is what empowers religion. The God of this world. Let me read it to you from 2 Corinthians 4 in the mirror. I'll read you from verse... Verse 2. We have renounced hidden agendas. And my note here is employing a little bit of the law in an attempt to balance out grace. (coughs) We have distanced ourselves from any obscure craftiness to manipulate God's word to make it mean what he does not say. With truth on open display in us, we highly recommend our lives to everyone's conscience. Truth finds its most authentic and articulate expression in human life. This beats doctrinal, any doctrinal debate. Verse 3, if our message seems vague to some, it is not because we are withholding something from certain people. It is just because some are so stubborn in their efforts to uphold an outdated system that they don't see it. They are all equally found in Christ, but they prefer to remain lost in the cul-de-sac language of the law. Verse 4, This is the one I was getting to. The survival and self-improvement programs of the religious systems of this world veil the minds of the unbelievers, exploiting their ignorance about their true origin and their redeemed innocence. The veil of unbelief obstructs a person's view and keeps one from seeing what the light of the gospel so clearly reveals. The glory of God He is the image and likeness of our Maker, redeemed in human form. This is what the Gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. And then Paul says, um, It is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who shone into our hearts. When John begins to write about this, he says the true light that enlightens every man was about to dawn. Paul says in verse 7, we have discovered this treasure where it was hidden all along. In these frail skin suits made of clay. We take no credit for finding it there. It took the enormous power of God in the achievement of Christ. To rescue our minds from the lies it believed. And then in the note I go on to quote my other most favorite verse in the Bible. It's in Matthew 13 and verse 44. Where Jesus tells in a very short parable the most beautiful. And he makes the most powerful statement about you. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that is hidden in an agricultural field. Just before we arrived here, we preached in a little town called Middleburg. It's a mining, a large town nowadays. It's a mining community in South Africa, coal mines. And a friend who invited us for the weekend conference told us of a chap in their um, community who inherited a piece of land, he says, but his brothers got the nicer sections. You know, he was stuck with this piece of land that you could do absolutely nothing with. 
couldn't farm anything on it. It was rocky, just rocky outcrops. You couldn't, cattle couldn't graze there. There was nothing you could do with it. And, and um, he wanted to sell it, but he thought, you know, I'll get nothing for it because it's just this, really, it's not an attractive piece of land. You can do no agriculture on it. And just recently, one of the biggest mining um, companies in the area offered him 30 million rand for it. What do they see that he didn't? There's more to the land than meets the eye. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in an agricultural field. Would you agree with me that the treasure is already in the field? You see, truth does not become true when you when you believe it. Truth does not become true by popular vote. There is only one faith that matters, what God believes. That's why Paul says it's from faith to faith. In Hebrews 12 says, Jesus is the author and finisher of faith. We've written in italics, your faith, but this is actually, we're just talking faith now. But you are in the picture. <laughs> That's the beauty of good news. You know, the best news becomes totally irrelevant if you feel excluded. <laughs> So in God's persuasion, in God's faith, He imagined you. He saw you. So truth does not become true by popular vote. So the treasure hidden in the field, this reminds of Paul's kind of language, you know, and he speaks about a mystery that was hidden for ages and generations. I'm so glad that no amount of time could diminish the original value. When Jesus tells the three beautiful parables in Luke 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, that word lost immediately implies ownership. Because you cannot be lost unless you belong. And how long was the lost sheep pursued? Until the shepherd found it. The 99 (laughs) could not be complete without the one. I'm so glad that God always sees the many in the one. treasure hidden in the field is the true value of the field. Later on in this section that we've just started reading now in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7 Paul says and we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You see this is the appeal of the gospel. That's why Paul says we commend ourselves to every man's conscience. The word conscience in the Latin means to see together. In Greek, it's exactly the same. Sun edo, to see together. The word hades is the opposite of that. Haides, not to see. The veil that remains. The veil that blindfolds the minds of the who? The unbeliever. The one who continues stubbornly to believe a lie about themselves. We are grasshoppers. No, you're not. I'm just an ugly duckling. I mean, that mirror is beautiful, but you know, it's just, it's too good to be true. I know me. No, you don't. Simon, son of Jonah. Yeah, that's me. I say you're a rock. Look to the rock. If you want to define yourself, you've got to go beyond your mother's womb. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. The quarry from which you were dug. (laughs) You're God's idea. When he wrote the script of your DNA, (laughs) he knew that there would never be another you. When God imagined you, He had a being in mind whose friendship, whose friendship would intrigue Him for all eternity. There is more to the field than what meets the eye. 
and the Greek word the agri, the agricultural field, suggests that this field already has an historic value. For generations, you know, we have plowed the land, we have grazed our, our livestock, and raised our livestock, and we've anticipated our crops, you know, how many um, vats of wine, barrels of wine we could harvest from this vineyard, how much bread we could gather. And in John 4, Jesus walks through the fields and he says, Do not say there are yet four months. Then comes the harvest. Hey, Jesus, what do you mean? Are you about to change the whole law of agriculture? I mean, we've done this for years. We, our great-grandfathers told us, this is the time to sow, there's a time to reap. Are you going to change the whole thing? He says, I want you to get the point. If you look for your harvest, you are looking at the wrong harvest. Your labor will not satisfy you. How much bread can you eat until you're really satisfied? Because you were not wired to live by bread alone. But your design is such that there is only one bread that truly satisfies. And when I discover in the incarnation, you see when Jesus took the bread and he broke it, the eyes were opened. And what the word already ignited in Luke 24, those two men on the way to Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us when he opened to us the scriptures. Suddenly the scriptures fell into place when they saw his face mirrored in theirs. When the bread was broken. You see, but there is another harvest that is already ripe, says Jesus. <laughs> his work was finished from the beginning. He says, lift up your eyes. Why? Because you cannot look in two directions at the same time. Lift up your eyes. Our minds have been so engaged with our own labor. Which is just a modern way of defining the law. But it's the same darkness. I am because of what I can achieve. Your bread will never satisfy. But there's another bread <laughs> that comes from above. Lift up your eyes and I want to show you harvest that you did not labor for. Mm. And it's already ripe. Mm. You know when a harvest is judged ripe, only once the seed in the ear matches the seed that was sown. Mm. So if it's not going to take my four months waiting, how did it ripen? Destroy this temple, says Jesus. And in three days, I will raise it up. Unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And when we lift up our eyes and we see ourselves mirrored in His resurrection, in his triumph, seated together with Christ, then the days of delay are over. The days of touring the wilderness, you know, lapping another round, they are over. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in an agricultural field. There is so much more to you than what meets the eye. But he has always known you. And in that same parable, Jesus says, the man discovers this treasure, and he goes away, and he sells all that he has, and he buys the field. Now we could easily reason, but this man who discovered this treasure, why would he go and sell all that he has? He could pick up this field for a bargain price, because nobody else knows its true value. You see, sometimes we have it in our minds that God had to go and crack a deal with the devil. You know, at least a discount. I mean, look at the miserable state that this world is in. 
somehow in our theology, we transfer ownership to a thief. And yet we're not prepared to do that in our courts of law. A thief never becomes an owner. At no point does a thief qualify to become an owner. And Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. Now that's a, large, a rather large claim. <laughs> John says he came to his own. Remember Luke 15, you cannot be lost unless you belong. He came to his own. Planet earth is the property of God. So when this man in Matthew 13 discovers the treasure, where does he discover the treasure? In the earthen vessel. Where it was all along. The field speaks of the earthen vessel. And he goes away. And instead of bargaining with the local market, you know, with the religious ideas and the Pharisees and try and bargain down a discounted value, you know, for this neglected old field overgrown with thorns and thistles, he went and he sold all that he had. And he bought the field. Now what happens? When a businessman is prepared to sell all that he has, then what he buys becomes all that he has. But we're already his. So why is God going into this transaction? Hebrews chapter 6 verse 11 verse 17 says, God desires to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose. You see, it's from faith to faith. God's desire is for us to participate in His persuasion about us. Jesus is what God believes about you. <laughs> you don't have to invent your own faith if you can have His. <laughs> you don't have to manufacture or fake joy when the joy of the Lord can be discovered. <laughs> My peace I give unto you. That means you don't need to struggle to get to a place of peace. Because my peace I give unto you. Yes. We're talking about the knowledge of the Lord, not our knowledge of Him, His knowledge of us. Yes. Our faith does not define God. His faith defines us. Yes. And in Him we discover the truth about ourselves. He sells all that He has and He buys the field. <laughs> Why? Because he has no one greater to swear by. He's not doing, dealing with the devil. He's dealing with our heads. I remember I was woken up one night, startled one night with this sentence that floated into my head. I was sleeping in Budapest, in Hungary. In Afrikaans we say, Yes, wakker. It's difficult to say that in English, but I skrikt wakkert. I awoke with this wow moment because I heard the sentence in my head. Hey, there is nothing wrong with this world. I thought only God can say things like that. So I turned the light on, I grabbed my pen, I wrote it down. There's nothing wrong with this world. And then I waited for the next sentence. <laughs> so I can say it and get away with it. But <laughs> <laughs> and the conversation just continues in the same persuasion. Do you know that God is persuaded about this world? Why can God afford to be persuaded? I mean, here's God dealing with Abraham and his wife Sarah. And God's not telling them, listen, we, <laughs> you guys better hurry up, you know, otherwise I'm going to have to backtrack my promise, you know. I mean, you're getting old now. <laughs> Abraham was 75 years old. His dad was 70 when he had him. Before that, all men had sons by the time they were 30, 35. Abraham's father had to wait until he was 70. Abraham's now 75. No son. Hallelujah. I'm just trying to remember where I was. 
<laughs> if I'm going to go to Abraham now. Don't kill my brother. I was in Budapest. Oh, ho, ho. <laughs> I'm talking about God's persuasion. You see, and God wasn't hesitant when he had to witness Sarah's dead womb. Sarah's womb had to die because what was about to be born was not of the flesh. Sometimes we think, God, you know, I mean, how dare you, you know, shock Ezekiel with this vision. Imagine a valley of dry bones. I mean, that's not the shocker. The shocker is the question God asks him. Can these bones live? God, I think it's too late. To be honest, I think it's too late. Can we have a replay? You know, maybe we can just, you know, go back in time and, you know, capture the moment just before death. Then maybe a good doctor could still pull a few through, you know, put them on a drip. But here we are confronted with death as far as death can take the human body. The hyenas and the vultures settled in. They, they were bleached bones. I mean, you couldn't even put them together. You didn't know whose bone belonged to whose bone. It was just bones scattered. And God says, can these bones live? You see, the persuasion of God ignites in us. For a moment, Ezekiel prayed the usual, you know, spiritual sounding prayer. Oh Lord, thou knowest. <laughs> it's amazing how we try and get away with these neutral prayers. Oh God, thou knowest. Moses, shut up. <laughs> you put out your hand and divide the waters. We would expect God to say, okay, now just stand so big and come to Just move, move aside and watch me do it. He says, Ezekiel, you prophesy. You speak to them bones. So that night in Budapest, I'm hearing the sentence. There is nothing wrong with this world. And it wasn't like a little whisper of like, I'm not sure whether I should say this. You know, maybe I'm misunderstood. God says, there is nothing wrong with this world. Why? Because there is nothing wrong with their design. Jesus did not come to apologize that God made some, some few flaws and a few mistakes when he constructed the human body. He was born, his passport to planet earth was his mother's womb. He was born in this, in this human body exactly like yours. And secondly, God said there is nothing wrong with salvation. The cross is indeed a success. What needed to happen, happened there. Jesus did not cry out, it is finished, so that we can get a new label for our ministry. He declared what God was absolutely persuaded of. What needed to happen for the salvation of this world happened on the cross. God rescued in the death and resurrection and our co-inclusion in there. God rescued his image and his likeness in human form. So that we may now all of us stand and witness with unveiled minds. The veil of believing a lie about ourselves are absolutely removed. And metamorphe, transformed into his likeness. The language of the Bible is the likeness of God. The image of God redeemed in human form. Jesus did not come to start the Christian religion. He came to unveil the likeness of God. What God is like. He shocks the Jews. He says no one knows God. No one knows the Father, in fact, he says. No one, oh, they knew God, but you don't know the Father. Until the Son reveals Him. So any idea we have of God that is unlike the Father Jesus reveals is not God. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. What is wrong then with man if there is nothing wrong with man? There can only be one thing. We are thinking wrong. We are thinking wrong. We're engaged with the wrong measure. Paul says, from now on therefore. You see, there must be a from now on, the, from now on therefore moment. Yeah. 
in my book, in the book Divine Embrace, I have a little chapter on the metanoia moment. I could have been so persuaded. You see, sincerity does not make something true. You can be sincerely wrong. from now on therefore I no longer know anyone according to the flesh mm. we had the wrong measure we tried to extract all kinds of good behavior out of people you know membership support just you know gather in my group make me feel good Paul's ministry was let me be absent much more in my absence mm. <laughs> discover the full extent of your own salvation look into the mirror man we're not doing display window stuff anymore it's mirror language if my message does not impress you with you, I failed you. We are not here to impress you with us. Mm. But impress you with you. <laughs> impress you with you. Hmm. <laughs> Nothing wrong with this world. What's wrong then? You're thinking wrong. And that night in... Uh, in um, that little room in Budapest, I, I read one of my favorite chapters again, Isaiah 55. I've preached that chapter many years. And it was, you know, when the Holy Spirit just endorses truth. You know, it's like kissing. You don't have to do it differently. It's just new every time. <laughs> it's just so amazing when, when the Spirit of grace speaks in your spirit. And there's no debate. I love what um, <laughs> Hebrews 6, 6, uh, Hebrew 6.17 says, God brought an end to all dispute. Yeah. No distance, no delay, no dispute. So often we go into dispute mode. Don't! You'll miss the message. You'll come back with a bigger question mark. Yeah. Every crooked place shall be made straight. When Paul says, if any man be in Christ, the if is not a question mark, it's an exclamation mark. It's not a condition, it's a conclusion. Right. If God be for us, but you know, you never know. <laughs> Verse 8 of Isaiah 55 says, Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Therefore your ways are not my ways. You see, we're wasting our time trying to get people to change and adjust their behavior. They're thinking wrong. And then God seems to make it even worse. He says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my thoughts higher than your thoughts and my ways higher than your ways. And so often the preacher would at that point close the book and say, God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. Amen. And close the service. <laughs> There's not even a hint of good news in those two verses. <laughs> Hang in there. The next verse has the good news in capital letters. God says, hey, let me give you a picture. Just now that you've got the heaven and the earth kind of sorted, just like the rain and the snow, come down from heaven on a mission. And what is its mission? To saturate the soil. Not just to tease you with a little drizzle here and a drizzle there. Reeds fall the drippels gedeer. <laughs> Can't say that in English. Oh man, we've been so tapped in. Oh God, we just need a little... Won't you dare open the heavens? He did! 2,000 years ago! Heaven, heaven owes you nothing. Every blessing that heaven has. God already lavished upon you. Deuteronomy 28 is outdated. Stop pursuing blesses and dodging curses. Every definition of curse was cancelled on the cross. Every blessing heaven has was lavished upon you through one act of righteousness. Can you see the rain and the snow? And what God says happens. Distance is cancelled. Cancelled. Saturating the soil. The Afrikaans phrase is much more powerful. The Hebrew word means dirvochtig. It means intoxicated. It's not just a little drizzle. You see, the incarnation is not Jesus taking on a percentage of human form. We're talking 100% incarnation. 
Jesus, if you've seen me, you've seen you. As I am, so are you in this world. 100%. I mean, the, the soil. <laughs> the soil now carries what the rain awakens. Instead of the thorn. Not the thorn tree that I have now de- to decorate with my little Christmas candles, you know, try and make the tree look better and get rid of some thorns in my life. Instead of the briar, you know, those briar leaves with the little tweezers, you've got to deal with these issues in your character. No, no, no. Instead of the thorn, instead of the briar, the fir tree, the myrtle tree, there is a resurrection because the rain has come. The rain has come. God owes us nothing. There is nothing wrong with your body. There is nothing wrong with you. Awaken in your mind. Awaken in your understanding. Discover the true you. You see, the prostitutes and the publicans did not follow Jesus because they thought, well, this is a nice compromise message he preaches. You know, we all feel comfortable with this message. No, they felt more than comfortable. They felt likeness drawn to likeness. They realized that the lie I lived before could never define me. I am defined by the blueprint of my design. Everything God ever had in mind for me is now mirrored in me. Our one friend wrote a song years ago. We preached and he came forward and he sang the song. I've awoken in your likeness, morning star, your brightness. I think I can still remember it. In your presence, Lord, I will sing to you. In your presence, Lord, I will bow before your throne. In your presence, Lord, in your glory I am at home. You've prepared this place, I see you face to face. I have awoken in your likeness. Morning star, your brightness, I lift my hands in worship to your name. For your glory is within me, to your praise I have been set free. My life is hid with Christ in God. I've awoken in your likeness. I've awoken in your likeness. Morning star, your brightness, I lift my hands in worship to your name. For your glory is within me, to your praise I have been set free. My life is hid with Christ in God. It's the greatest awakening to awaken to His likeness. Then my conversation changes. We thought, you know, that you've got to believe in your heart and say with your mouth and say after me. And we think, now I've got this little sinner's prayer all packaged. Hey, Paul's speaking about a new conversation. It's a new conversation. Because suddenly, truth hits home. And my heart cannot be deceived. It's not from here to here. It's from here to here. It's from the heart to the head. Be ye renewed where? In the spirit of your mind. The deepest seat of consciousness. Where there's a sunedo. A Bluetooth happening. (laughs) Spirit entwined with spirit. And suddenly I know, even as I've always been known, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. (laughs) He overwhelms you with his knowledge of you. I think can be more personal. Evangelism becomes such hard work. If you haven't seen you yet. <laughs> How can I fulfill the law to love my neighbor even as I love myself? God, you don't know my neighbor. <laughs> as you love them? As you love yourself. When God introduces you to you. And you discover you mirrored in him. The way he has always known you. He was never distracted. He's always known you. So that we may now know. And in this knowing there's such freedom. There's such liberty. That wonderful metanoia moment. 
say, so shall my word be that proceeds from my mouth, just like the rain, just like the snow. So shall my word be that proceeds from my mouth. Now remember, we are designed to live by, we translated every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So we thought, okay, now we're going to have to get a hold of every single word in this book. No, no. The word every in the Hebrew is the word K-O-L. It means in its most complete form. The word was made flesh. So God says, so shall my word be that proceeds from my mouth, not diluted through years and years of traditional interpretation and multitudes of translations. You see, there is no perfect translation. There is only a perfect word. And his name is Jesus. And his name spells out your salvation. My word that proceeds from my mouth shall not return to me empty. Jesus did not return to the Father and say, Father, well, we've got a few. We'll have to wait a few more thousand years and then rapture the rest. He returned with a full harvest. The full harvest. We're celebrating the full harvest. God wants you to discover your own salvation. <laughs> there is not a compartment. There is not a nook or cranny in you, in your innermost being, that is not clearly defined in this gospel. Totally liber liberated, freed from your innermost being. You have an innermost being. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the gold. They discovered the first gold in a friend of mine's farm in the Free State. And she told us, you know, it wasn't difficult to change our minds about our farm. <laughs> because the gold changed our minds. Yeah. Yeah. Don't make the renewing of the mind difficult. Right. Embrace the gold. Amen. Thank you so much.